Ура. 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 Um, today is a significant day for the Senate after 37 years in the radio commentary booth. Terry Malcolm is about to retire. His last question time from the Senate is today. Terry began parliamentary broadcasting in 1976 when presenters were confined to a tiny booth overlooking the chamber at what is now known as Old Parliament House. Terry has ridden a wave of change since then, including the establishment of the radio service we, now, uh, we know today as the new Parliament House. Terry Malcolm has an abiding affection for the Australian democracy. For a decade, he was the chief of staff for the ABC News Radio's parliamentary broadcasting team. He was also a parliamentary guide for a similar length of time. For more than a third of a century, it was a rare parliamentary year that ended without Terry Malcolm's voice featuring in it. A year without Terry on ABC Radio at all was even rarer. Even after 37 years, Terry Malcolm has approached each day's broadcast with the same rigorous commitment to detail, clarity and professionalism. On behalf of all senators, Terry, we wish you the very best in your retirement. And for the sake of the Hansard record, whilst clapping can't be uh, recorded in Hansard, uh, neither can the nod of appreciation from Terry. But uh, that should also be there. Before proceeding to question time, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Australian Political Exchange Council 17th delegation from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to uh, Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. Yes. Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. For the information of senators, I inform the Senate that Senator Bob Carr will be absent from question time today and tomorrow. He is visiting Indonesia on foreign affairs on official business. For question time this week, for Order. question time this week, Senator, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong will take questions on foreign affairs and trade. Senator, Senator the Honourable Joe Ludwig will take questions on defence and veterans affairs. Uh, question, we move to questions without notice. Senator Betts. Mr Rudd must be confident Order. about his numbers. My question is to the minister representing the, minister, the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Can the minister assure the Senate and the Australian people that the government of which he is a member is united and cohesive? Order. Now, when, the, when there's silence, we'll proceed. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr President. And uh, once, again, once again, those opposite have an opportunity to take advantage of the democratic process in this country. Question time. And they could ask about any topic, Mr President, that they want. But as always, they want to go the low road. They could ask how robust how robust is Australia's economic growth and performance? And they would be told that we are the envy of the Western world. You could ask, well, what have you done? What have you done in the health area? And they would be told that we have made significant reforms for more doctors, more nurses, more bedtime. They could be asking about education, they could have the opportunity to support the single biggest reform in education. Order, order, order. Senator Macdonald's on. Mr. Mr. President, it's a point wait, of wait order. a minute, Senator Macdonald, you haven't got the call. Senator Macdonald. Mr. President, it's a point of order. I just ask you whether this is directly relevant to the uh, question. There's no point of order. Uh, Senator Conroy. Mr. President, they could ask a question about the levels of debt in this country, because they like to talk about it all the time. And they would be told 
that we have one of the lowest net debt ratios to GDP in the OECD. OECD. They could ask about our credit rating, Mr. President, and they will be told that we have a triple A credit rating across across all three of the agencies. They could ask about the unemployment rates. They could ask and they would find out that we are 5.5, well below the OECD average. And they could ask about job creation, Mr President, something that those vandals over there, something that those vandals over there were happy to see 200,000 Australians thrown onto the scrap heap onto the dole. But now this government, Mr President, stood firm during the global financial crisis and we supported Australian families. And we have, we have according Order, to the Federal Order, time's expired, Senator Conroy. Order. Now, when there's silence, I'll ask Senator Abetz to proceed. Senator Abetz. I note the question was completely avoided. Can I ask, what was it the low road for Mr Bob Hawke to say that? If you can't govern yourselves, you can't govern Australia. And does the minister agree? Given the continuing chaos and dysfunction of the government and the instability and uncertainty surrounding the Prime Minister's continuing tenure in her office and hence the tenure of all her ministers, how can the government claim to be putting the interests of all Australian people before its own? No, when, when, there's, when there's silence, when order, when there's silence, will proceed on both sides. Both sides. The minister. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. This government is absolutely focused on delivering for Australian families. Absolutely focused on addressing the real issues. The real issues. That is why we are building the national broadband network. It's why we've created disability care, a national disability insurance scheme. It's why we're building a world-class education system through the National Plan for School Improvement. It's why we're focused on creating 950,000 jobs since we came to office, despite a 28 million lost jobs lost worldwide, Mr President. It's why we're keeping the pressure, the downward pressure, on inflation at 2.5 per cent, below the 10-year average, below the 10-year average of 2.8 per cent. And Mr President, it's why, because of the economic policies that we are focused Time's on. Time's expired. Senator Betts. Let's see if we can get an answer to this one. Does the minister have any conception of how incompetent and untrustworthy he and his colleagues appear to Australian families in their self-interested manoeuvrings over the government's leadership? Does the minister understand that the Australian people deserve to be properly led by a competent and trustworthy government that keeps its promises, does what it says and always puts the interests of all Australians first? The order. Order, order, Senator Conroy. Mr. President, those opposite introduced work choices with no notice to the Australian public. Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Rabbit cut health funding massively after looking down the barrel of a camera and saying, "I won't do it. I won't do it." Because it is true, Senator for Vanty Wells. Because Mr. Rabbit was asked about it after the after the 04 election. And what did he, Mr Rabbit said? Oh, I did, I did think about resigning over that one because you know, I clearly got rolled in Cabinet later. But no, I decided to stay in the government. So you've got Tony, Mr Tony Abbott, who stared down the barrel of a TV camera and said, no, we'll never do this. We'll never do this while I'm the health minister. So don't come in here. The party with John Howard that supported carbon pricing, the party that during the election campaign in 07 campaigned for carbon pricing, and the party, the party, Mr. President, that continues to want to bring Order. back. Order. Time's expired. Senator Pratt. Mr. President, my question this afternoon. Wait, wait a minute, Senator, Senator Pratt. You're in. Senator Pratt is entitled to be heard in silence. Order. When Senator Pratt, when, when Senator Pratt can be heard in silence, I'll give her the call. Order. Is 
Now, when, when, when there is silence, we'll proceed. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Industry and Innovation, Senator Lundy. Can the minister outline to the Senate the actions being taken in Australia and around the world to tackle what is dangerous climate change? And how does this compare with predictions? Order. Order. The minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Industry and Innovation, Senator Lundy. Uh, thank you, Mr President. A price on carbon is working to reduce emissions. Emissions in the national electricity market have fallen by 7.4 per cent in the first 11 months of the carbon price being in place. Mr President, this action is not being taken in isolation. Senator Lundy, just resume your seat. Um, Senator Lundy is entitled to be heard in silence. If you wish, if you wish to have co private conversations, I invite you to go outside, but not across the chamber. Senator Lundy. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, this action is not being taken in isolation. By the end of this year, around one billion people around the world will live in a city, province, or country with a price on carbon. And this includes provinces in China, our largest trading partner. Last week, the first of China's seven pilot emissions trading schemes kicked off in Shenzhen. The scheme will cover 600 companies responsible for 40 per cent of the city's emissions. The start of the scheme was not marked by the city being wiped off the map, nor has the Shenzhen stock market crashed. In fact, at the end of the first day of the scheme, it closed not down, but up. Mr President, for years the opposition has claimed that the rest of the world isn't acting on climate change, and on more than 50 occasions they have said that China would never act. What we, what we know is that the Leader of the Opposition is on the record as saying China is never going to hit themselves with an emissions trading scheme. Well, that is wrong. It, it's absolutely wrong, and we can see action taking place in China now. Mr President, the fact is that the rest of the world is acting, with one billion people living in a place now with an emissions trading scheme in effect, uh, shows that the world is acting not only to contend Order. climate change, but of course acting in line with Labor's approach. And it's about time those opposite started acknowledging the fact that this is part of a global movement to tackle climate change. It is the responsible thing to do, and of course that is why it is left to the Time's Labor expired. government to Time's take expired. this important action. I'll give you the call, Senator Pratt, when there is silence on my left. If you wish to debate the issue, the time is at three o'clock. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Having spoken about uh, dangerous uh, about international action, uh, Minister, can the um, minister please advise? what other world leaders are saying about climate change and what actions are being taken. The minister. Uh, look, thank you for that supplementary question. Uh, Mr President, overnight the President of the United States has made clear, and I quote, we don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. Sticking your head in the sand might make you feel safer, but it's not going to protect you from the coming storm. And ultimately, we will be judged as a people and as a society and as a country on where we go from here. Mr. President, that is the end of the quote from the President of the United Senator States. Senator Lundy, just resume your seat. Resume your seat. If you wish to debate it, as I said, you debate it after question time on both sides. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed on both sides. When there's silence, we'll proceed. When there is silence, we'll proceed. Senator Lundy. Thank you, Mr. President. And contrary to claims of those opposite, President Obama still prefers 
a market-based approach, as you stated today. In my State of the Union address, I urged Congress to come up with a bipartisan market-based solution to climate change like the one that the Republican and Democratic senators worked on together a few years ago. And I still want to see that happen. I'm willing to work with anyone to make that happen. But this is a Time challenge that expired. does not cause Time's expired, the Senator Lundy. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please advise how emissions can be reduced in alternative ways and what might the costs be of such policies? Minister. minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, as we can see, President Obama is working down the same path that Labor has, but now we are, only, we are the only, approaching this the only economically responsible way to reduce it, which is through a price on carbon. Um, but we know these facts are an anathema to those opposite. To achieve the same emissions reductions as our package, the opposition would slug households $1,300 per year. And today it's been revealed they've dug another budget hole. Apparently, Mr Abbott will repeal the carbon price immediately. And under the Liberals' plan, the vast majority of industry assistance for the coming financial year will have already been paid out. Yet the polluters will no longer be obliged to surrender their permits for their pollution. And that's a $10 billion uh, hit to their budget. They need to explain where that shortfall is coming from, otherwise they will be further exposed for their dishonesty in relation to their climate change policies. Before calling Senator Cormann, I draw honourable senators' attention to the presence in the President's Gallery of former Senator Ross Lightfoot. Welcome, uh, former Senator Lightfoot. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. Uh, I remind the minister of the Prime Minister's commitment that there will be no carbon tax under a government I leave. Why then does Australia have the world's biggest carbon tax, a carbon tax which is about just to wait, Just wait a minute, Senator Cormann. On my right, Senator Sen Senator Cormann is entitled order, order. No, order. Senator Cormann, like every other senator, is entitled to be heard in silence. Order. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed on both sides. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I again uh, remind the minister that uh, the Prime Minister made an emphatic promise before the last election that there would be no carbon tax under a government she leads. Why then does Australia have the biggest carbon tax in the world, a tax which is about to get uh, bigger uh, when Labor will hit families and business with yet another 5 per cent increase uh, in their carbon tax? Order the, order the minister representing the prime minister, Senator Conroy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. And can I thank you, congratulate the senator on uh, memorising that this morning in front of the mirror, uh, Mr. President. In the election three years ago, the prime minister said Australia needed to act on climate change. Something, something that was not dissimilar to Mr. Howard. Not Order. dissimilar to what Mr Howard said in 2007 and signed off by all of those deniers now today. And Mr President, Senator the Conroy, Prime Minister, just, just resume your seat. Senator Conroy, continue. Mr President, and the Prime Minister said that our country needed to put a price on dangerous carbon pollution. That's exactly what John Howard wanted to do in 2007, Mr. President. It's what Mr. Tony Abbott agreed when he was in Cabinet. It's what Mr. Abbott said in 2009. And just last week, as has already been mentioned by my colleague, China put a price on carbon. Last night, President Obama set out how the world's largest economy <coughs> is tackling climate change. We welcome President Obama's comments 
They show that the world's largest economy is committed, Mr. Senator Conroy, just resume your seat. On my left and my right, if you wish to debate it, you debate it after three o'clock. I'm, I'm entitled to listen to Senator Conroy in silence. Senator Conroy, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, we welcome President Obama's comments. They show that the world's largest economy is committed to tackling climate change. Mr President, President Obama's plan takes action to cut carbon pollution in America. It prepares the US for impacts of climate change and lead international efforts to address global climate change. He said that he would establish carbon pollution Order. standards. Order. Time's expired. No. When, when, when there's silence, Sen Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain uh, why the Gillard Labor government designed its carbon tax, already the biggest carbon tax in the world, as a tax which will go up and up and up every year? when families are already struggling to cope with cost of living pressures and businesses are already getting hit with massive increases in the cost of doing business in Australia? The, uh, the Minister. Mr President, an oldie but a goodie is back. That python squeeze, that wrecking ball, Wyala wiped off the map. They're all back over there. They're all back over there. And Mr President, what we know is that this is just yet more proof more proof that those opposites have no plan to deal with the challenges of global climate change, because their direct action plan just will not work. Mr President, it is another reason that Mr Abbott will not, Mr. Abbott will not live up to his blood oath to repeal the carbon price. He will not. And the climate change departmental officials, Mr President, have told Senate estimates that soil carbon measures can only reduce emissions by around 4 million tonnes in 2020, less than 5 per cent, 5 per cent of what Mr Tony Abbott is claiming for his plan. Order. Time's expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, is there any chance that the Prime Minister will legislate to rescind the planned increase uh, in the carbon tax on Monday? to help struggling families and to help make business in Australia more competitive again. The Prime Minister. Mr uh, President, the, uh, it's sorry, not surprising. The minister representing the Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you. Mr President, it is not surprising that those opposite don't want to talk about their plan. Because this is what Mr Tony Abbott, Mr. Tony Abbott said in November 2009. Order, order Senator Conroy. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's a point of order in relation to the requirement to be directly relevant. Uh, the minister has not been directly relevant in either the substantive or the supplementary question before us, but this question was very specific about whether there was any scenario uh, in which the Prime Minister would consider rescinding uh, the increase in the carbon tax which is planned for Monday. Uh, he is talking about Mr. Abbott that has got nothing to do uh, with the plans that the government may or may not have uh, in relation order. to the planned increase in order. the carbon tax. Order. Um, I do remind the Minister of the question. You've still got 43 seconds Thank remaining. You, Mr. And, Mr President, as I said, those opposite do not want to talk about that plan. They will not acknowledge the following facts about the government's position. Emissions, emissions in the national electricity market are down 7.4 per cent in the first 11 months. That's 12 million tonnes less carbon pollution than for the same period last year. Renewable energy generation is up by almost order, 30 order, per cent. Order. Send, send a Brandis. On the requirement that the minister be directly relevant to the question asked, the question was would the government consider rescinding the increase in the carbon tax to take the pressure of families and businesses? The minister has not addressed that question. He's, a, he's addressed in general the question of carbon pricing, but he was asked whether the government would do one thing, that is rescind the upcoming rise in the carbon tax. He has not addressed himself to that question. Order. Order. 
Order. When, when, there's, when there's silence, I have Senator Collins on her feet. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Conroy is being relevant to the government's policy position here, which is clear and which he has outlined. Order. At, at the 43, with 43 seconds remaining in the question, I did ask the minister to address the question. I remind the minister of the question. And the minister does have 13 seconds to address the question. The minister. Those opposite refuse to acknowledge the facts that their scare campaign about the impact of the carbon tax has been seen through, seen through by the Australian public, with all Order. of the measures the school kids Time bonus, has the family expired. assistance. Senator Conroy, resume your seat. Resume your seat. Order. Now, when, when there's silence, I'll call Senator Millen. Sen Wait a minute, Senator Millen. You're entitled, like any senator, to be heard in silence. Order. Senator Millen. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Senator Lundy. Is the minister aware President Obama said in his major speech on climate change, and I quote, Allowing the Keystone Pipeline to be built requires a finding that doing so would be in our nation's interest, and our national interest will be served only if this project does not significantly exacerbate the problem of carbon pollution." Unquote. If so, does the minister agree that allowing projects that exacerbate carbon pollution are not in the national interest? And if she does agree that they're not in the national interest, will the government now reject coal extraction from the Galilee and Bowen basins because they significantly exacerbate the problem of carbon pollution? The minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Senator Lundy. Um, thank you, Mr President. Um, the vast majority of coal mines in Australia are not emissions intensive and will not face material increased costs under a carbon price. With Treasury modelling projects that Treasury modelling projects that, that under a carbon price, the coal industry will grow. Um, and in addition, there will there is currently a $99 billion pipeline of investment into the coal mining sector, with 93 new projects either just completed or under construction or awaiting approval. Therefore, the government recognises that there are a small number of gassy underground mines that have high methane emissions and will face increased costs under a carbon price. And we've addressed this in the coal sector jobs package. Um, and after taking, taking this into account for assistance for gassy mines, the average impact of the carbon price on coal mines uh, will be reduced. Um, so the answer to your question is that we uh, believe strongly that we are able to manage our plan to reduce uh, the uh, emissions from uh, the coal sector in Australia over time. Uh, we will be able to do this uh, with the carbon price in place. And just uh, going back to uh, the point you make about statements from uh, the President of the United States, we warmly welcome uh, the US President's commitment to um, uh, um, reducing uh, emissions across the US. Um, we know the president said uh, that science in, is unequivocal and the US plans to take a leadership role in acting and, most importantly, um, that the best policy for reducing pollution is through a market mechanism. Um, you know, any claims, as we've heard from those opposite, uh, that the president doesn't support emissions trading, as I said, is just one more mendacious claim to add to Order, a growing Order, time's expired. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the minister well knows the reference is not to fugitive emissions but to burnt coal exported from Australia. So I ask her again, does she accept that coal from the Galilee and Bowen basins extracted from Australia and burnt wherever in the world will exacerbate the problem of carbon pollution and is therefore not in our or anybody else's national interest? Is that the case, minister? Order. The, the minister. Yeah. Uh, Mr President, Australia is of the view that all nations should be taking action on climate change, and that's why we have welcomed, that's why we have welcomed the action that has taken place recently in China. 
It's why we welcomed the statement of the US president just yesterday. And it's why that when, uh, when we act, we do so uh, with leadership and knowledge and understanding that we are acting amongst a growing number of nations around the world. And I mentioned in an earlier answer, Mr. President, that some one billion people around the world now live in a province, a region or a country uh, that is in, ha, lives in a, a position where an emissions trading scheme is in effect, is in operation. And we will continue to promote and propagate our view around the world that all nations need to take action on climate change in, in conjunction with us. And I think the recent action, as I said before, Order. shows Time's that expired. Australia Lundy. is providing Senator, a strong Senator leadership Mill. position. Mill. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, is the minister aware that President Obama also called for Congress to end the tax breaks for big oil companies? If so, does the government agree it's time to end tax breaks for fossil fuel companies, in particular the $2 billion, the $2 billion fuel tax credit for the big miners in Australia? Water, the, the minister. Well, Mr President, can I answer the question this way? I don't know how, how, how many more ways I can describe the Labor government's commitment to taking action on climate change. We are doing so in a responsible way, in a responsible way that allows our industry sectors to help transform to a low carbon future. We've done that with a comprehensive plan of both an emissions trading scheme, which is not only implemented uh, but it's going particularly well. Uh, we are doing it with a renewable energy target and we are doing it with a series of investments through our clean technology program to businesses to help them reduce their carbon footprint. And with these mechanisms in place, along with investment in, uh, um, as I said, companies who are seeking to reduce their carbon footprint and improve their technologies, we believe we have the balance right. And Mr President, can I Order. remind you— Time's expired. Senator Scott Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. I refer the Minister to comments made by the Parliamentary Secretary for Small Business earlier this week that, and I quote, small businesses don't pay the carbon price. It is a price paid by Australia's biggest polluters, unquote. Given the Prime Minister confirmed last week that as of Ju uh, July 2014, transport fuels are covered by the carbon tax. Doesn't this mean that thousands of additional small businesses in the transport sector will now actually be paying even more for Labor's carbon tax through higher fuel prices? Order, order, order. On, on, on my right, on my right, on my right. Senator Ryan has asked a question, and I need silence on both my right and my left. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Once again, those opposite seek to misrepresent the facts to the Australian public. Mr. 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 President. Order. Those, those opposite continue with their fear campaign. They deliberately misrepresent and overstate the impact of the carbon tax. The carbon tax, according to those opposite, was going to wreak havoc across the economy, Mr. Mr. President. And what have we seen? What have we seen? Uh, Senator, what have we seen? Senator, order on both sides. Order on both sides. When there is silence on both sides, we'll proceed. On my right, on my left. Senator Conroy. Mr. President, those opposites have no end to their misleading and deceptive discussion on this issue. Because as the Council, as the Council of Small Business of Australia data shows, the electricity cost of a typical small retail business makes up less than 2 per cent of total cost. Less than 2 per cent. So a 10 per cent price increase would be less than 0.2 per cent. 
0.2 per cent of total costs. Mr President, for a typical small business using 10 megawatt hours of electricity per year, this is around $5 per week. Mr President, $5 per week. In most cases, business electricity costs are expected to be passed on and have been taken into account in the design of the government's household assistance package, which is delivering tax cuts, higher family payments and increase in pensions. Order. And we have put in place a range of programs. Sen Senator Conroy, just resume your seat. It's not much use if you're asking for an answer to the question, then debating it whilst the question is being answered. And there, is, there should be no one interjecting from the other side as well. So, Senator Conroy, continue. You've got 15 and Mr. Seconds. President, we have put in place a range of programs to support small business. For example, we have increased the instant asset write-off to $6,500. So, Mr. President, for those officers Order. to continue— Time has expired. Senator Ryan. Thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware of ASIC data, which shows that small business insolvencies have hit a record high over the past 12 months since the carbon tax was introduced? When will the government finally concede that its carbon tax has made the operating and input costs of running a small business more expensive at a time few have the capacity to absorb this impost or pass it on to consumers? The minister. Mr President, never let the facts get in the way of the opposition's propaganda. I will repeat. Mr President, because it is clear that despite the fact, despite the fact that I've already answered this impact, despite this, those opposite are reading out their pre-prepared questions. So let me again state, Mr President, the Council of Small Business of Australia data shows the electricity cost of a typical small retail business makes up less, Mr President, than two per cent of total costs. Uh, oh, not what you hear. Well, you should get out more. You should get out more. So a 10 per cent price increase would be less, less than 0.2 per cent of total costs. So again, I repeat, for a typical small business using 10 megawatt hours of electricity per year, this is around $5 a week. So those involved in this hysterical, deceitful— Order. Order. Senator Ryan. Thank you, Mr. President. The minister is correct. I was reading. I can read and I can, Order. Also, I can also count. Um, I refer the minister to the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry Small Business Pre Election Survey, which reported that 63 per cent of small businesses nominated abolition of the carbon tax as the most important thing the government could do to help their small business. 63 per cent. Why won't the government rescind the planned 5 per cent increase in the carbon tax due next Monday in order to give small business some help, or do we have to wait for tomorrow morning's ballot? Order. Order. The, the minister. Mr President, as I said, never let the facts or the truth get in the way of an opposition in question time. The fact they don't like more than any other is that the carbon price is working. It is driving investment in new renewable energy sources and it is reducing emissions. Emissions in the national electricity market fell by 7.4 per cent in the first Senator 11 Conroy, months. Just, just, just resume your seat. If, if senators wish to debate it, I've pointed out earlier that the time to debate these issues is after three o'clock. Order. When there's, when there's silence, we'll proceed. <laughs> Senator, Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. President. I know those officers don't want to accept simple, straightforward facts. The emissions in the national electricity market fell, fell by 7.4% in the first 11 months of carbon pricing. That's a reduction of 12 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. We have also seen electricity generation from renewable energy that is sold on the national electricity market has increased by almost 30 per cent, Mr President. Order. It is doing expired. this. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Order. President. My question is to the Minister for Science and Research, Senator Farrell. Can the minister explain to the Senate why the strategic research priorities 
are important for supporting Australia's ongoing research excellence. No. When there's silence, we'll proceed. The Minister for Science and Research, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Polly uh, for her very good question and her ongoing interest uh, in the uh, world-class, the world-class uh, science uh, research that uh, Australia conducts under this government. Last Friday, uh, Mr. President, uh, I joined the Prime Minister, the Chief Scientists. Uh, uh, Minister Emerson uh, and at the, uh, at the uh, Prime Minister's Science, Engineering and Innovation Council, where we launched the government's strategic research priorities. Uh, these uh, strategic uh, research priorities took the place of the national research priority. These, this change was foreshadowed in the Australian government's national research investment plan which was released in November 2012. Mr President, there are 15 uh, priorities and they're designed to drive Australia's research investment. The priorities align with the five societal changes covering issues of immediate and critical importance to Australia. These challenges address the priorities. Chain, uh, living in a changed environment, promoting population health and wellbeing, managing food and water assets, securing Australia's place in a changing world and, most importantly, lifting productivity and economic growth. Glad to see you agree, uh, Senator Abetz. Now, uh, University of Australia's uh, Chief Executive, Belinda Robinson, welcomed these priorities. And I'd like to quote from what uh, um, um, Belinda Robinson said about these priorities. She said that the priorities provide a focus to support prudent research investment decision making and will help to ensure that the return to the nation on this investment is maximised. These, these priorities. Time's expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary. Can the minister outline how the Gillard government has invested in science, research, and innovation sector to ensure all Australians? to ensure all Australians benefit from our world-class research. When there's silence, we'll proceed. On my left, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Order. The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, President. Um, and I again uh, thank uh, uh, Senator Polly for her very insightful uh, supplementary question. Uh, under this government, uh, Mr. President, investment in science, research and innovation has increased by nearly 30 per cent compared with the previous uh, Howard uh, Coalition government. In the 2013-14 budget, we committed $185 million over two years to uh, continue with the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. NCRIS, as it's known, funded projects in support of important research work that will benefit future generations. We've also committed a further $135 million over the next five years to extend the Future Fellowship Scheme, which will provide for 150 more fellowships. Uh, and you may be interested in this, Senator Polly. The Antarctic Climate and Ecosystems Cooperative Research Centre, based in Hobart, received an extra $25 million uh, in, uh, over the next five years. Uh, and we've invested Time has million expired. Senator, Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister outline how these investments support our economy and our jobs? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Polly once again for another uh, very good uh, supplementary question. Uh, our, yes, well researched, uh, as Senator Abetz uh, said. Uh, our investment in, uh, in the Hobart based uh, Antarctic CRC will support Tasmanian jobs, uh, Senator, Senator Abetz. The Antarctic sector is very important to the Tasmanian economy and is worth nearly $200 million per year. Around 1,000 people are employed in this sector, supporting nearly 100 small and medium uh, enterprises. I know you laugh about it, uh, Senator Abetz, but, 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 but this is very important to the people of Tasmania. 
This is very important to the people of Tasmania. Our, our, well, I know, I know, I know, I know that this is important to the people of Tasmania, and it's a good, it's a good, it's a good decision for this government to make. Our $100 million investment in the new health and biomedical facility, supporting life-saving research and training for the next generation of healthcare Order. professionals. Order. Time's expired, Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Minister, I refer the minister to the confirmation given by the Prime Minister last week that if Labor is re-elected, the carbon tax will be expanded to include coverage of heavy on-road vehicles, our truckies, from the 1st of July next year, when the carbon tax again will increase to $25.40. Will the minister inform the Senate exactly how much extra per litre of diesel truck operators will, truck operators will be paying in 2014-15? under Labor thanks to the continued expansion of the carbon tax. Order. Order. Minister, order. The minister, order. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Mr. Conroy. Mr President, thank you. I'm going to thank Senator uh, Williams for his uh, question. Mr President, all fuel for passenger motor vehicles, including petrol, diesel and LPG, and fuel for light on-road commercial vehicles is not subject to a carbon price. Households and most small businesses already pay fuel excise on their transport fuel and do not face a further carbon price. That is because the government knows fuel costs are a major expense for family budgets. The government has carefully considered the treatment of fuel to balance the needs of households and most small businesses who are already paying the highest rate of excise and those who pay little or no excise. The combustion of fuel creates carbon pollution, and putting an effective price on that pollution through the excise system for some fuel users plays an important role in creating an incentive to switch to lower emission fuels. Use zero emission biofuels and use fuel more efficiently. Biofuels will not be subject to an effective carbon price. There is no adjustment of fuel tax credits for heavy on-road vehicles for the first two years. This has given trucking businesses time to get their systems and contractual arrangements in place. The government's comprehensive household assistance package takes full account of the extent to which these modest increased costs flow through to household budgets. It will have a very modest impact on transport costs, adding around 29 cents to the cost, 29 cents to the cost of moving a ton of goods 100 kilometers. The transport industry already deals, already deals with the frequent movements in international fuel prices, which regularly have a much greater impact than the proposed for the effective Times carbon expired. price. Order, Senator Williams. Supplementary question, Mr. President. Minister, which, if any, trucks will be exempted from paying more for their diesel fuel under the new carbon tax diesel cost plan by your government? The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Transport is not directly subject to a carbon price under the government's carbon pricing mechanism. They do not need to buy and surrender permits. However, some businesses get fuel tax credits, which mean they pay no excise or just pay a road user charge. Fuel tax credits have been reduced for some businesses, such as mining businesses, who use fuel off-road, so that they face an effective carbon price. Heavy on-road vehicles will be exempted for the first two years, as I've said, but the government does intend to bring them into the system from 2014. 15. Senator Conroy, just, re tax. just resume your seat. Senator Williams is on of order, relevance, Senator Williams. Mr. President, which, if any, trucks will be exempted from the carbon tax fuel levy? No, I believe simple the question. Will it, are there any and which ones? I believe the minister is answering the question. The minister still has 15 seconds remaining. The minister. President, fuel tax credit entitlements will not change for agriculture, forestry and fisheries meaning they do not face an effective carbon price. 
as aviation does not receive fuel tax credits, the government Order. increased domestic. Order. Time's expired. Order. Order. Just wait a minute, Senator Williams. When there's silence, Senator Williams. Further supplementary, Mr. President. Are industry estimates of the tax being more than $500 million slug on Australian truck operators accurate? And are these increases supported by key stakeholders, such as your beloved Transport Workers Union, who have described the carbon tax as a death tax? Order. Order. The, the minister. Mr. President, those, those, opposite, those opposite will continue to spread any disinformation that they can. Already today, we've seen claims about. Already today, we've seen claims about job losses. We've seen claims about companies being closed. All, Mr. President, ignoring the fundamental facts of the economy, the growth in the economy, the growth in jobs, the growth uh, in economic uh, activity, the growth of our economy overall. So those opposite, Mr. President, have no real interest except in trying to mislead the Australian public consistently. They want. They want no one to examine their alternate policy, Mr. President. They want no one. They want no one to examine what Mr. Abbott has consistently said on this issue, because Mr. Abbott has changed his position time after time. In 2009, order. time has expired. Time ex order, Senator Xenophon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. My question is to Senator Ludwig, representing the Minister for Defence, and it follows a series of questions I asked last week on this the same issue. Has the Australian Signals Directorate or another intelligence agency, directly or indirectly, obtained access to strategic components of the national broadband network in order to facilitate surveillance or monitoring on Australians? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Xenophon for his continued interest in uh, uh, in uh, uh, Defence Signals Directorate. Uh, but all communication and deception activities, uh, can I say, by uh, uh, government agencies are conducted in strict accordance with Australian law. Uh, in Australia, the privacy of communications uh, is protected uh, by the Telecommunications Interception and Access uh, Regime. Uh, and it is referred to as the uh, Interception Act. Uh, but the Interception Act prohibits, and I think it's worthwhile repeating this, uh, uh, many in the chamber would have already been on many committees uh, who have uh, got first-hand knowledge of this, including uh, Mr President Senator Xenophon, but the Interception Act prohibits the listening to, copying or recording of a communication as it passes over an Australian telecommunications system. Communications in Australia can only be intercepted under a warrant. Agencies such as the police must obtain and independently issue warrants for the investigation uh, of serious offences. AGO itself has to obtain the authorisation of the Attorney General for its warrants on matters pertaining Senator to national Lodbury, security. Senator Xenophon. Point of order, Mr. President. This is, is an issue of relevance. The question is very clear. Has the Australian Signals Directorate or another intelligence agency sought, sought, sought um, to have access to the NBN in order to facilitate surveillance. Order. Uh, Senator Wong. Well, uh, on the point of order, Mr. President, um, the Senate, Senator Ludwig is outlining the framework which applies uh, under the law uh, to any surveillance activity. Order. Order, Senator uh, and uh, what, I'd suggest you, what I'd suggest, uh, Mr. President, is that's entirely relevant to uh, a question that is all about whether or not uh, any such activity may or may, may not have been undertaken. I believe the minister is answering the question. The minister still has 48 seconds. The minister, Mr. President, uh, what I was doing, of course, was providing uh, that answer. But it's also in this framework, Mr. President, that as a matter of principle and long-standing practice, may I say, the government does not comment on intelligence matters. However, however, having said that, I can say that communication interception activities carried out by government agencies are conducted, as I said, in strict accordance with the Australian law. I can also say that we do have a very strong legal framework to protect Australian citizens uh, in 
and particularly uh, to protect Australians uh, around uh, this area. The Intelligence Services Act 2001 agency, such as the Australian Signals Directorate and the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation, are required by law Order. Uh, to time, obtain time specific authorisation. Time has expired. Senator Xenophon. I have another go, uh, Mr President. Um, the, the, the question was, has the Australian Signals Directorate or any other intelligence agency sought access to the NBN for the purpose of surveillance, not just interception as defined in the legislation, but also metadata collection. Um, that, 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 is, that, is, that is none of it. So can the minister directly answer a very direct and discreet question on this issue? Order. Order. But it, it, it's the same. The, the uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it, it is the same answer I have given. This is a repackaged uh, a question uh, of the primary question. Again, uh, Mr. President, I will belabor this point. Uh, it is a long-standing practice of successive governments not to comment on intelligent matters. And as, as I said, having said that, having said that, uh, we do have a very strong, a very strong uh, legal framework for the protection of Australian citizens uh, in the in what I call the Interception Act. Uh, it is and has been very long-standing. Uh, both uh, ASIO uh, and the Defence Signals Directorate have a strong legislative framework that ensures uh, the Australian uh, public are protected uh, around their privacy issues. There are requirements for, the, uh, for as I was saying earlier, uh, for specific authorisation either from the minister or the Defence uh, Minister or the Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, to produce intelligence on a, an Australian. Time's expired. Senator Xenophon. Does the Minister acknowledge you don't actually need a specific authorisation for metadata collection? You don't need a warrant. And given that the United States Signal Intelligence Directive 18 defines interception as occurring not when phone calls, emails, and electronic data are stored, but when a human actually accesses that information. Is it the case that Australia's Telecommunications Interception Access Act and the Surveillance Devices Act provide no oversight at all of any mass surveillance of Australians, including surveillance via the NBN? The Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, again, uh, Senator Xenophon uh, does want uh, more information uh, that, uh, of course, we do have a Senate, uh, uh, I should say, a committee uh, which uh, does have oversight uh, of this area, such as the PJCIS. Uh, uh, they have, uh, uh, in what I would call uh, a unique place in uh, this parliament, to provide uh, information from uh, these particular agencies. Uh, what I'm not going to do, uh, Mr. President, on behalf of uh, the Defence Minister, is get into an argument uh, about. Uh, what type of intelligence uh, material is dealt with. There is a, as I've said, there is a long uh, uh, policy, a long standing, uh, and I'm not going to go into the detail. Uh, what I will say about that policy is uh, not only is it a policy uh, that both uh, uh, this government and successive governments have abided by about not talking about intelligence matters, uh, it does seem to be a, a, a tiff between Senator Zenith and time's expired. Senator Rustin. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. I refer the Minister to Labor's planned review of the carbon tax required to be undertaken in the next term of Parliament under Labor's own carbon tax laws. It requires consideration of the effectiveness of the coverage of emissions and potential emissions under the carbon tax. Will the Minister rule out a re-elected Labor government ever expanding the coverage of the carbon tax to the agricultural sector or the family car? Order, order, order. The minister representing the prime minister, <laughs> Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you. Uh, the government has made its position on these issues very clear. Agricultural emissions are excluded from the carbon price mechanism, and the sector will receive significant assistance to transition to a low-carbon future. Agricultural emissions from livestock and fertiliser use and fuel used by agricultural activities are exempt from the carbon price. The Carbon Farming Initiative will create new economic opportunities for farmers and other landholders who take action to reduce emissions. The CFI is supported by a $1.5 billion land sector package 
which reinvest carbon price revenue in our land sector, including through the Biodiversity Fund and Carbon Farming Futures Program. The Coalition Mr. President, plans to rip up these programs and cut the essential capacity building and research which they support through regional Australia. Treasury modelling shows that with agricultural emissions excluded from a carbon price, gross output in the agricultural sector is projected to be higher with a carbon price than without. The sector is projected to grow by over 130 per cent by 2050. And this modelling does not take into account all of the programs that will assist the sector in the CEF package. For example, Mr. President, the $200 million Clean Technology Food and Foundries Investments Program is providing funding to assist food processors improve their productivity through investments in low pollution capital equipment. And in the budget, Mr. President, the government announced it will bring forward $160 million in Clean Technology Investment Program funding to 2014-15. Senator Rustin. Okay. Um, second, um, first supplementary, I refer the minister to government plans and his answers to previous questions here today to expand the coverage of the carbon tax to heavy on-road vehicles. Given you admit to extending the tax to trucking operators, can you confirm that this will cost the trucking industry over $500 million next year? And why should Australian families have any confidence that the family car won't be next? Order. The order. The order. The order on both sides. On both sides. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I would, I would make the point that some of my colleagues have that that is almost uh, an identical to uh, Senator, Senator Williams's question. But, Mr. President, I repeat. Transport is not directly subject to a carbon price under the government's carbon pricing mechanism. Order. Senator Russ. What time did we finish? Second supplementary. Given the Prime Minister's promise immediately before the last election. Order. Senator Rustin. Senator oh, Rustin. Senator Birmingham. Order. You get a question up today. Order. Order on my right and my left. Senator Rustin is entitled to be heard in silence on both sides. On both sides. On both sides. On my left. I'm waiting to call Senator Rustin. Senator Rustin. Given the Prime Minister's promise immediately before the last election that there would be no carbon tax under the government that she leads, which was broken in spectacular style, coupled with their existing plans to extend the carbon tax to the Australian trucking industry, why should Australian farmers or families believe any assurances Labor gives that it won't extend the carbon tax beyond into the future? Minister. Mr President, those opposite continue to try and airbrush airbrush out of history their own Howard government position on this issue. Just nothing to talk about over here. Move on. Move on. Because Mr Howard took to the 2000, 2007 election a carbon price. You had a market price. I know it's hard. Sen Senator Conroy, it's hard. Senator Conroy, on both sides, on both sides, On both sides, Senator Conroy. Because, Mr. President, this is what Mr. Rabbit said. This is what he said. I just airbrushed it out of history. The Howard government proposed an emissions trading scheme because this seemed the best way to obtain the highest emission reduction at the lowest price. That was that was his own book on page 171. Then, of course. He said the politics of this issue have changed. I think the politics of this issue have changed dramatically because he'd already described in very unflattering terms, very unflattering terms, which I suspect you would make me withdraw if I order, repeated. Order, order, order. Mr. President, I ask that all further questions be placed on notice.
Senator Ludlam. President, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 74.5, I ask the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Conroy, for an explanation as to why answers have not been provided to questions on notice number 2980, asked on May 16, 2013, uh, re relating to the Point Perrin Canal development in, uh, in uh, the Perth metropolitan area. Senator Conroy. Thank you. I, I have no advice at, uh, at this point in time, Senator Lullum. I'm happy to take that on notice and see what I could uh, find. To. I haven't received any information. Senator Ludlam. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. Um, I look, I move that the Senate take note of the answer, or I guess the formal absence of an answer, by the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment. But I should say it's, it's obviously not Senator Conroy's fault if the Minister that he represents in here um, hasn't sent him across a brief, but we have been in touch with the Minister for Environment. We gave them plenty of notice that I was going to put this, uh, put this matter to the Chamber. Deputy, as everyone in this chamber knows, answers to questions on notice are due in 30 days. And the clock is running down on this parliament, and I'm very keen for an answer to this question because it pertains to events that are occurring right now in my home state of Western Australia. Uh, and this uh, question being asked on the 16th of May 2013 should actually have been answered last week. It concerns a recommendation in April by the West Australian EPA that the unwanted and obsolete Point Perrin Canal development should proceed, so long as it meets certain conditions. I'd like to categorically emphasise the absolute rejection of this approval by the scientific community and the broader community of the region. 380 individual questions and matters have been submitted as part of the EPA appeal process. Deputy President, it's not just myself that is keen for an answer. There are at least 8,000 people in Rockingham also waiting on an answer about the future of their backyard. Point Perrin is a place that they consider, and we in the Greens consider, is too precious to lose. This is a place that they and we will fight ferociously to defend from Premier Barnett's absolutely preposterous and obsolete 1980s-style canal housing development that nobody in the region wants. If it is allowed to proceed, it will see the regional park on Point Perrin bulldozed and dredged the seagrass meadows and marine habitat of penguins, dolphins, fisheries and countless species in Mangles Bay dredged, and the adjoining freshwater Lake Richmond, which is home to one of just two surviving ancient thrombolite communities in WA, uh, impacted very severely upon. <laughs> Deputy President, Question 2980 has several components on all of these issues. And environmental vandalism is part and parcel of the Barnett government's unhappy reign. These issues are raised every day by the Greens across Australia as the only voice in Parliament that is actually standing up for our precious environment. This particular case is very different. The land in question was transferred from the Commonwealth to the state of Western Australia in 1964 on the strict condition that its future use be restricted to a reserve for recreation and or parklands. The Commonwealth in 1968 then confirmed that the land must not be used for private industrial, commercial or residential development. A good commitment. Will the Commonwealth require the West Australian government to honour these commitments, these commitments that were signed? The Minister for Finance in 2011 indicated in written correspondence that I'll quote, the federal government has an expectation that the WA government will acknowledge the undertakings previously given in relation to the site. So it's a very simple question. Will a written agreement signed between the state of Western Australia and the Commonwealth be honoured or not? Is a signed agreement an agreement or not? I expect an answer to my question 2980 very soon, and I ask that the government treat this particular development with the utmost caution. I would particularly uh, commend Senator Conroy to bring a brief from the Environment Minister while this parliament still stands. It is not good enough for the campaigners, uh, led by the inexhaustible Dawn Jex, uh, who has been pursuing state and federal governments on this matter for years. My state Greens colleague, uh, Lynn McLaren, MLC, who has been working on this issue for years, representing the broad interests of the community of that part of the Perth metro area, who do not want an unwanted and obsolete 80s-style canal development uh, rammed into the coastline that they treat uh, uh, with such respect and regard. This is a matter that the Commonwealth Environment Minister could put to rest very, very easily by simply noting that the Commonwealth will expect the Western Australian government to honour its agreement uh, that it was signed uh, so many years ago when, this property, uh, uh, when, these, when these agreements were exchanged. 
That is something that we believe should be uh, clarified and resolved in this parliament and set to rest. Otherwise, we will uh, continue to run the campaign all the way through and out the other side of the federal election until this place is given the regard and the protection that it so richly deserves. Thank you, Senator Ludlam. Uh, the oh, Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I wish to speak on the motion to take note uh, as well. And I say to the previous speaker— so, Sorry, Senator Macdonald. Uh, I'll just clarify. It's not, it's not a motion to take note. It's a motion uh, that the minister's failed to supply I, an I answer. Thought, I thought the senator moved that they take note of the minister's lack of answer. Yeah, well, it's just failure to supply. There are two distinct, uh, in the standing orders, there are two distinct motions. This one is failure. It's not taking note of um, okay, the Okay, answer. well, yeah. whatever the motion, but that's you can the one speak, I want you to speak to, to uh, Mr Deputy President. Thank you for that uh, guidance. But I just say to the previous speaker, uh, the arrogance shown by Minister Conroy and Minister Burke uh, just shows the contempt with which this government holds the Australian public. And yet this is a government that Senator Ludlam and his team have kept in power for the last three years. And f fancy the hypocrisy of uh, the Greens political party in complaining about uh, Senator Conroy and Mr Burke when they have kept them in power in the last three years. Now, Mr uh, uh, Deputy President, uh, this refusal, the cavalier way in which ministers in this chamber simply ignore the rules of the Senate, ignore uh, senators who ask questions and expect answers, who simply just don't follow the forms of a democratic parliament. That contempt is typical of the contempt with which the Labor Party has treated Australians in the last uh, three years. From the time when the Prime Minister promised solemnly, hand on heart, that she would never introduce a carbon tax and then immediately and capriciously and knowingly broke that solemn promise until today, until today uh, where ministers just completely ignore the processes of democracy by refusing to answer questions, even in the case of where Senator Ludlam, uh, as a Greens member, part of the Labor Greens Alliance, gives notice to the minister that he is going to raise this. Does the minister do anything about it at all? Absolutely nothing. And the contempt and the arrogance with which the Labor Party treat this parliament is palpable. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, if the people of Australia need any other uh, reasoning, any other evidence of how poor this government is, they only have to look at the way in which the Labor Party treats with contempt the people of Australia in the way they run this parliament. The question is that Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr Deputy President. I wasn't intending to contribute on Senator Ludlam's motion regarding Senator Conroy, but I was inspired by Senator Macdonald to do so and indeed inspired out of deep concern of the pattern of behaviour uh, that Senator Ludlam's motion highlights with regards to Senator Conroy uh, and the approach that he and his office take to the answering of questions. Now, Senator Ludlam may come in this chamber today and complain that Senator Conroy's office and Senator Conroy have failed to answer questions in a timely manner, but this is hardly the first occasion on which such a failure has occurred. We have had countless instances, both through the chamber and in particular through the Senate estimates process, where Senator Conroy has proven himself to be a serial offender at failing to answer questions in a timely manner or within the timeline set by the standing orders for this chamber or by the committees when it comes to how they relate to the operation, of course, of the return of questions on notice. So, Mr Deputy President, I can recall sitting in Senate estimates committees where Senator Conroy provides answers from three, four, five months ago of questions that had been asked, not just weeks before the committee meets again, not days before the committee meets again, not even hours before the committee meets again, but while the committee is meeting. Wow. While the committee is meeting, some months after the preceding Senate estimates, we then get back the answers 
from the previous Senate estimates. It's a completely contemptuous approach, a terrible precedent that this minister sets as the leader of the government in the Senate for all of his fellow ministers in terms of the types of standards that they should be adhering to when it comes to actually being accountable to the parliament. That's what questions are for, a level of accountability. Accountability through the questions without notice, accountability through questions on notice in this chamber and, of course, accountability through the Senate estimates processes. And on all of these levels, Senator Conroy is a demonstrated failure. He failed in this place to give answers to the questions that are asked of him. He fails when it comes to answering questions on notice through this chamber in any sort of timely way. And he fails abysmally when it comes to the Senate estimates proceedings to provide any type of answer. So, Mr Deputy President, I'm pleased that Senator Ludlam has called Senator Conroy out today and brought attention to this one instance, but I would hate for anybody to leave here thinking it is just one instance. There are many other instances that Senator Conroy and other ministers in this government are guilty of, and it is to the shame of them, as it is to the shame of the Australian Greens, that it is only now in the dying days of this government that they have started to highlight such failures on the government's part. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. The question is the motion moved by Senator Ludlam in relation to the failure of response to question on notice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Birmingham. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Conroy during question time today to, Senator, to questions asked by Senators Cormann, Ryan, Williams and Rustin, and so move. Uh, Mr Deputy President, three years ago we were told by Julia Gillard, Ms Julia Gillard, the Prime Minister, the then new Prime Minister, that she was taking charge of a good government that had lost its way. That was the justification given by Ms Gillard for her, her seizing, her unprecedented seizing of the reins of the Labor Party leadership and the Prime Minister of this Prime Ministership of this country from Mr Kevin Rudd. She claimed that it was a good government that had lost its way, that caused people like Senator Farrell and Senator Feeney and Mr Shorten to engineer unprecedented change that saw the Australian people effectively go to bed one night with one Prime Minister and wake up the following morning to discover they had a different Prime Minister. And the Australian people were having absolutely no say in the matter just, of course, the factional controllers of the Labor Party. Well, it may then have been a good government that lost its way. Now it is simply a lost government. Mr Deputy President, this Labor government, whether it's under Mr Rudd or Ms Gillard, long ago lost any sense of unity. As the old saying goes, if you can't govern yourselves, you can't govern the country, and that is clear from what we see of those opposite. The ongoing civil war in this government really knows no boundaries. This government equally long ago lost any credibility for its financial management of the country. The record debts we have seen, the record levels of deficit, the promises to return the country to surplus this year only, of course, for those promises to be broken. This government long ago lost the confidence of the Australian people to successfully deliver any of its programs, be they the school halls program, which saw massive cost blowouts and, of course, a great waste of taxpayer money, be it the pink bats program. Order, Senator Birmingham. Point of order, Senator Brown. Mr Deputy President, my understanding was that um, Senator Birmingham was taking note of the answers given to questions by, to Senator Conroy answers by Senator Conroy given to questions in question time today, except for Senator Abetz's question. And so far, Senator Birmingham has got nowhere near the questions that were um, given and nor the answers given by Senator Conroy. And I ask, draw, ask you, drawing back to what the questions. Th thank you, Senator Brown. Senator um, Order, 
Order. Senator uh, Birmingham is in order. Uh, he um, is responding to the answers given by uh, Senator Conroy and uh, some of the content of the answers given by Senator Conroy, uh, what uh, Senator Birmingham is referring to. And as you know, there is some latitude to the debate, providing you stick to the topic matter. Senator Birmingham is relevant. You have the call, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr Deputy President. And this government long ago lost any claim to be making Australia more competitive, especially because of its carbon price, Senator Brown, as one of those many features in relation to where this government has lost its way, lost its credibility. The carbon tax, the mining tax, the creation of Australia's business environment as being now one of the least cost competitive places in the Western world to do business. It is to the shame of this government that its policies, including those discussed today, are such a demonstration of how much it has lost its way. We now, of course, have the reality that this government has, to be frank, lost any sense of moral compass whatsoever as each of its members spend far more time worrying about their own jobs than they are about the jobs of other Australians. Every single member of this government seems to be completely preoccupied, not with the impact of the carbon tax, not with the hurt to the confidence levels in the Australian business community or the hurt to the competitiveness of Australian business, but they are preoccupied with the bad polls that are afflicting their government and with what they can do about it by changing the Labor leadership. And now, to be frank, Mr Deputy President, they have reached the point where this government has lost any reason to be taken seriously at all. The, um, the cannibalisation of the Labor government is an amazing feat to watch, where we have now seen leadership ballots and battles in June of 2010 in February of 2012, in March of 2013 and now again in June of 2013. Well, Mr Deputy President, it would all be a big joke if it wasn't so serious for the harm it's doing the country, if it wasn't for the fact that with the sideshow happening opposite, they've lost complete focus of the important policies and the harm some of their policies, like the carbon tax, are doing to the Australian people. While the sideshow continues, Australia suffers with the highest carbon tax in the world, with the broadest coverage of the carbon tax, with an increase next year, an increase the year after, with expansions to trucking industries and with Senator Conroy today failing to rule out hitting the family farm or family car as well. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Ferner. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, once again, today in question time, we heard a perpetual uh, continuance of the smear and fear campaign that those opposite have delivered consistently along the, the path of their opposition as uh, critics to the, the um, emissions trading scheme that we have introduced as a government. And I know, re on reflection, many, many years ago on, on the Climate uh, Change Select Committee I was on, and Senator Feeney was on that committee as well, we heard first hand evidence from economists explaining why we need to introduce a emissions trading scheme into our, our, our country and, and serve it well and look after the, our, our environment, our unique environment. And we should look at the report card based on what this scheme has delivered since uh, the 1st of July. For a start, emissions in the uh, national electricity market are, are down now by 7.4 per cent. Renewable energy generation is up almost 30 per cent. And I recall during those inquiries of uh, people coming to us and explaining the renewable en energy possibilities in this country, as far down south as, as the Great Ocean on, on wave um, uh, renewable en energy, on, on solar, on, on wind technology, all those possibilities has generated one thing I know those opposite have an issue with. I know they have an, op have, have an issue with uh, jobs, and they will stop the jobs. They will stop the jobs in this country if, if they are elected. And uh, one of the reasons why they will do that is they'll, they'll wind back, they'll, they'll stop all our, our renewable energy uh, uh, targets, our new, new re renewable energy uh, accomplishments. Out, as a result of the, the report card, there's been 150,000 new jobs has been created as a result of our emissions trading scheme. If it hadn't been for our scheme, 150,000 jobs would not have been created. And we know those opposite, opposite will stop the jobs if they are elected as a result of them winding back the emissions trading scheme. 
We know also they'll, they'll claw back the, the good uh, household assistance packages that were provided to many low income earners, many pensioners around the countryside, and they claim that you know, they won't take the, the amounts back off them, but we know that's, that, that's a fallacy. We know that that's the situation that they'll lead to. Mr Deputy President, I was privileged recently to attend a um, source manufacturing uh, company in the, the uh, southern industrial areas of Yatla on the way down to the Gold Coast um, a few weeks ago. I was down there, and uh, the proud owner of that, that company is only a small company. We heard today in the chamber questions about the impact of emissions trading on, on small businesses. This is a small business of approximately a little under 70 employees. But as a result of our assistance as a government in uh, granting them $109,000, uh, a bit over $109,000, and accompanied uh, with the, their contribution as well, has seen technologies where there's solar panels on the roofs of those, fac those buildings there at that f factory now, generating solar energy back into the, into the uh, organisation, into the, the enterprise, to make sure that they are getting some benefit out of, out of the, out, out of the uh, environment. And in doing that, they're cutting their emissions. And, Deputy President, this is some of the, the, the results we're seeing. They're helping to reduce their power bills by $19,000. They're also intensifying their, their operations by 31 per cent. So this is what these sorts of programs are all about, is assisting small businesses, assisting the environment and getting people um, you know, protected by the effects of, of climate change. And, I just wanted to address what's happening in my own state because what's happened up there, we've got a Conservative government. A, I've never seen such a Conservative government in my life, the Liberal National Party up there. WA, uh, oh, well, Senator Searle, I'll yeah. take that interjection. Yeah. There'd be a, a stark comparison between the two states to see who is, who's the most Conservative. But up there, they're increasing, they're, they're increasing electricity prices by twofold. You know, we've got people out in the streets after, after the, the Premier up there sacked over 25,000 employees in that, in that uh, state, struggling on their knees, and here's a Premier of the Liberal National Party in Queensland wanting to jack up in, uh, electricity prices. And you can imagine what's that doing to, to the economy. You imagine, what, imagine what's it doing to, to, to people in, in that particular area. You know, it's disgraceful that we need to see that sort of conduct from a, a Liberal National Party government uh, in my home state of Queensland. And that's just a curtain raiser, what we will see in this nation should we be extremely unfortunate enough to see ourselves in a situation where the Liberal National, um, those opposite, form government Thank in, you, in this Senator nation. Thank you, Senator Ferner. Your time has expired. Senator Edwards. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. And I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Conroy. Uh, to questions asked by Senator Cormann, Ryan, Williams and Rustin. And I just take the chamber back and it's good to see a couple of TWU old fellows over there on the other side to listen. Three of you, sorry, I, I apologise, Senator Feeney. Oh, Senator Feeney, the, new, the, the, the soon to be member for Batman, uh, we think. Uh, or of course, uh, it would have been far better if you were a woman. Uh, Senator Feeney wouldn't have caught it, caused anywhere near the controversy uh, that uh, y yes. So, uh, and I, I digress, uh, Mr. Deputy President. But three years ago, three years ago, uh, on Monday last, uh, was the changeover to the now Prime Minister uh, Julia Gillard. Uh, what time is it? Is she still the Prime Minister? Uh, Half past three. Well, I, I'm not quite sure. Where, who is the Prime Minister? Order, order. Senator Edwards, uh, point of order, Senator Fern. Point, point, point of order. order. Point of order, Deputy Chance. The same point, point of order Senator Brown made earlier. The questions that were put to the, the government in question time were related to carbon price and nothing to do with that question that was related to leadership and other speculation came to Senator Abetz. Uh, from Senator Betts to Senator Cormann. And I draw your attention to the fact that the, the Senator over there is misleading 
misleading the chamber in regards to, to uh, thank you. this, this part of Thank taking, you for the point of order. You're going to debate it. Senator Feeney on the same point of order. I just think from the government's perspective, this performance is so terrible, I have no desire to interrupt that's, it. That's no, <laughs> point of, that's no point of order, Senator Feeney. Um, on, the, on the point of order, uh, Senator Edwards, I would draw your attention uh, to the motion before the chair. And uh, you uh, haven't addressed the substance of the motion in your opening remarks, and I'm sure you're about to move there. Thank you, Senator Edwards. I am. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. And uh, in relation to the carbon tax questions, I'm not sure quite where I can go back to whether it was Prime Minister Rudd's carbon tax uh, uh, ETS proposal in which uh, he was axed uh, and brought down uh, without an election, and uh, and then. Uh, Prime Minister Gillard came in and introduced a carbon tax, uh, by, uh, but after prefacing it going to that election saying there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. However, we have got a carbon tax. Uh, look, the, uh, in actual fact, it's the biggest carbon tax in the world, uh, and by far. And I do point out to uh, uh, this week's uh, uh, pricing of carbon in Europe, which is around about five euro, which is about $6.87 in our money, a long way from it. And you're proposing to put it up. And I was very pleased to hear that uh, the opposition climate uh, spokesman, Greg Hunt, uh, move a suspension of standing orders to allow him to call on the government to scrap the increase which is proposed for the 1st of July, a 5 per cent increase on the biggest carbon tax in the world. And, and then in, in answering questions, and I, I really find it quite amusing when those on the other side, the, the Labor Party, talk about small business. They are the only government in this country that has taken big business to small business. And I'm, I, I know, because I still am involved in, uh, in business. Uh, and uh, I don't know too many small businesses that use tw uh, 10 megawatt hours uh, a year. Uh, it must be somebody sitting at home with their computer on, because uh, and it only it, it works out to $260 increase. Well, you know that's a lot of hot dinners. You 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 can dumb it. It's called reduction to the ridiculous. Five dollars a week. Yeah. Well, let's just reduce it. What is that a day? It's less than a dollar a day. Well, it doesn't really matter. But on top of all the other dollar a days that has that has gone on in the reign of this Rudd Gillard government, there's just so many, so many of them. And well, and now which, and in answer to Senator Williams, in answer to Senator Williams on on fuel for heavy transport, it's only 29 cents. 20, 29 cents, he said. 29 cents a tonne per 100 kilometres. I'm quite happy for you to take it up with him, Senator Gallagher, if you think it's 27. But look, I'll only apply it to my own experience. 7,000 tonnes of grapes coming through a winery uh, with an average trip of about 200 kilometres uh, a, per trip. Uh, and that's uh, an increased impost on that business of $4,060 per annum. But Let's just reduce it, dumb it down to that argument where the punters out there will, will not have any idea as to what on earth you're talking about. Anybody that drives a truck. Order, order. You're, you continue, Senator Edwards. Thank order, you. order on Thank my right. These trucks will be. Oh, but they're going to be exempt, aren't they? For what? For two years? Okay, but it's coming at you like a tsunami. I, where is Tony Sheldon on this one? Where is Tony Sheldon, your, your boss, on all these things? He's nowhere to be seen. It's, what do they call it? A death tax. Road users get a carbon tax. How ridiculous. They're already paying an excise, and so is mums and dads, but you didn't rule that out. Senator Conroy didn't rule that out in his answers, did he? And look out for the farmers. You're coming after them as well. Thank you, Senator Edwards. Senator Stirl. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. And it is always a pleasure to follow on from Senator Edwards. But, uh, and I do say that tongue-in-cheek, Mr Deputy President. But, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President, I just think we have to clarify a, few, a couple, of, couple of silly statements from Senator Edwards. And I've got to tell you, we're coming for the farmers. What a ridiculous statement. I mean, the minister's made that very, very clear through you, Mr Deputy President, and you know that that is a mistruth, Senator Edwards. So just keep stirring up the scare campaign. 
But uh, can I go to another point, Mr. Deputy President, where Senator Edwards, in his stumbling five minutes of I don't know what it was actually, or something to do with grapes, but um, where he actually attacked the good persona of the federal sec or the national secretary of the Transport Workers Union, Tony Sheldon, when he said, "Where is Tony Sheldon?" Well, Mr. Deputy President. Let me just remind those opposite where Tony Sheldon and, and, and thousands of Australian truck drivers work, along with this side of the federal political sphere, uh, probably about 18 months ago when we were introducing through the other house, through Minister Shorten, the uh, Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. Let's have a little walk back through history, shall we, when in this place that none other than the good Senator Gallagher, Feeney, uh, for, for, uh, uh, Mark Fernson, the Ferno, myself, stood up here for hours and battered, and there's 30 years of my previous life and a lot longer through my good friend Senator Gallagher to bring a safe, sustainable rate to Australia's yeah. trucking industry. Yeah, yeah. A safe, sustainable rate where our truckies could go out, leave home, kiss the kids goodbye, wave goodbye to the wife head off up north across the Nullarbor, wherever it may be, knowing that they could have a rate that would bring them home safely, a rate that would give order, them Order, the Senator Stirl. <laughs> Senator Edwards, point of order. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy President, what, I, I see no relevance to the subject matter on rates, safe rates, uh, to uh, the taking note of questions. Uh, it doesn't revolve. It, nothing you have said has even attempted in the two minutes, nearly two thank, minutes, thank that you. You, you have. And I and I ask you to direct him to the. Thank you, well, note Senator, of the Thank you, Senator Edwards. Senator Fern, I really don't need assistance, but if you want to speak to the point of order. On the Sen point of Senator order, Senator Fern, uh, Deputy President. Certainly during question time, it was uh, Senator Williams. Uh, asked questions in relation to the transport industry. Senator Stirl is clearly answering the, the, the taking note of, of answers provided here today based on what was provided during question time. Thank you. Even, even Senator Macdonald had his little toy truck out there in front of him playing with it. Thank you, Senator Ferner. Senator Stirl, uh, you are in order. You, uh, you are sticking within the realm of the debate. Uh, you have the call. Senator Stirl. Very much for that protection. Uh, Senator Edwards, that's disorderly. Senator Stirl, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I think the five minutes of Senator Edwards was disorderly, but that's not casting aspersions on your good self. I wouldn't do that, Mr Deputy President. As I said, on this side of the chamber, those of us who fought for years, Mr Deputy President, to give our Australian, our Australian truckies the opportunity to leave home and get home safely in one piece to be sustainable, because they are constantly faced with a, with a barrage of, 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 of challenges and costs. And we talk about this side of the chamber, and may I, through you, Mr Deputy President, mention Senators Williams, Cormann, Ryan and Rustin, that all of a sudden, in a one-hour period today, uh, have all become friends of the trucking industry. Now, I sit here and I do listen at times. I do. I, I actually do listen if I can stay awake long enough with some of the rubbish that goes on in here. But how dare they, Mr Deputy President, in one hour today decide to become friends of the trucking industry to be worried about the cost, the on-road cost of Australia's heavy vehicle industry, when in this chamber last year every man and woman to a T voted against the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, that voted as a block proudly after filibusting debate against safe rates for Australia's truck drivers. So I find it through you, Mr Deputy President, highly hypocritical. The, in fact, the level of hypocrisy in this place doesn't surprise me, but today it did sort of tweak a little nerve. And I have to just continue there, Mr Acting Deputy President, that I think to myself, are they standing up for Australia's trucking industry or are they standing up for Australia's transport operators, those small businesses like Mr Deputy President? I was for 11 fantastic years. I built my own little business. I fed my family. I built a house with the great support of my wife. I couldn't have done it without her while she was home bringing up two babies while I was away uh, every fortnight running between Perth and Darwin on my own. There was no fatigue management them days. There was no safe rates. There was no road safety remuneration tribunal. There is now today. Thank you to the Labor government. Thank you to the support of the Greens and thank you to those great independents who realise that truckies do deserve to get home safely to their families. So I'll come back to the accusations from those four senators, Mr Deputy President, 
and how dare they pretend to be friends of the trucking industry when they wouldn't even, through their, uh, the leader of the Nats when I asked him to come out, and I won't use the word blue because I have sooks on the other side who want to talk, uh, report me, but to have a debate in any trucking yard in Australia with any trucking operator about the value of safe rates, which you all None of you picked it up. The leader of the opposition, the, the next, didn't have the intestinal fortitude to bring on a debate with me at his calling. None of you stood up for Australia's trucking industry. And in one hour today, you're friends of the trucking industry. Who are you really friends with? The ATA? Is it the major operators? Thank you, or is Senator it Coles Stirl. and Woolies? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I also rise to take note of answers given by Senator Conroy to questions asked by Senators Cormann, Ryan, Williams and Rustin. Mr Deputy President, I rise today to talk about the people who create jobs in this country, particularly those who create jobs in South Australia and give a future for our young people, our children. And the problem with this government that Mr Crean, one of the previous ministers who was sacked, has said of the Prime Minister that she has a tin ear because she doesn't listen. And when it comes to the carbon tax, there is no clearer case than this tin ear. On radio in South Australia, the Prime Minister was asked by Mr David Basham, head of South Australian dairy farmers, about the impact of the carbon tax on dairy. Now, he highlighted the fact that this was costing small businesses in South Australia between $14,000 to $25,000, which is a significant impact. The Prime Minister's response? Did she listen? Did she care? No, her response was mere rhetoric. Oh, she said the industry will thrive. Have all those scare stories come true? Well, here was somebody telling her about the real impact on a small business and about the fact that dairy farmers were losing money. And when they go out of business, not only is that product not available, but the jobs that are supported, both on the farms and the associated industries, go with it. In terms of small business, we heard Senator Conroy today say, oh, well, that impact is only about 2 per cent to a small business. Does he not understand that for many small businesses, their net profit margin is well under 10 per cent? And so that is a significant hit to a small business who are looking to fund investment in the business growth, as well as quite often taking their salaries out of their profit margin. It is small business that creates jobs and opportunities for young people in South Australia, and it is small businesses who are being impacted by the carbon tax, particularly when it goes up by 5 per cent at July. Small businesses are often the ones who are driving vehicles powered by diesel. And with the abolition of that rebate in July, their costs will increase further. And in a competitive market, they have very little opportunity, if any, to pass that on to their customers, which means that there are more jobs at risk. Small business in South Australia that work in the area of refrigerants, R404, I guess. The ACCC has found that at the original price of $98 per kilogram, that the gas was directly responsible for a 76 per cent rise in the price of that gas, some $74.98 that the ACCC found was directly attributable to the carbon tax. For larger business, just this month, the head of GMH in South Australia responding to the closure of Ford, responding to calls by unions that they should manufacture the SUV, the Captiva, in South Australia, was talking about the fact that the input costs for manufacturing in Australia are too high for them to remain competitive. He was looking at all sorts of options, including reducing wages of both executives and workers as a way to achieve that. But the alternative, he said, the alternative would be for the Gillard government to scrap the carbon tax. So from small business, from the agricultural sector with dairy farmers, through to large business, People who create jobs for South Australians have one message for this government, which is demonstrating yet again its tin ear. The carbon tax is hurting business and damaging jobs for people in South Australia. Lastly, BHP and Olympic Dam. South Australia was devastated in April of 2012 when they announced that they were shelving plans to expand Olympic Dam. And there was a lot of talk about why that might be. One of the factors people don't often look at is that with electrolytic refining of copper, which is one of the main products coming out of Olympic Dam, electricity availability and price 
is one of the top considerations for the viability of a copper mining activity. You've only got to go online and look at prospectus for people who are looking to set up mines in places like Laos or South America, and you see that availability and price of electricity rates very high. At the time BHP made that decision to shelve their option for expanding Olympic mine, the carbon tax was $23 a tonne, and it was planned to increase by 2020 to $37 a tonne, and just at the time when BHP would be hoping to see a return on their investment in creating lots of jobs, the carbon tax would have been $350 a tonne by 2050. Is it any wonder that industry, from miners to big business to small business, is saying that the carbon tax is a job-destroying tax for South Australians? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Uh, the question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Milne, on a separate matter. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers by Senator Lundy, representing the Minister for Climate Change. Uh, President Obama last night made a major speech on climate change. Everyone has, been, everyone has been waiting for this speech because he has, on several occasions, referred to the action he will take on climate change, and people have been waiting for him to make this a legacy issue. As we all know, he has not been able to get emissions trading uh, through uh, the uh, parliamentary processes in the United States, and so the upshot of this is he made a major speech. In that speech, he made a few points which are extremely relevant to Australia. The first is in relation to the Keystone Pipeline. He said that he would have to take into account in, in approving that pipeline whether it's in the national interest to do so because it would not be in the national interest if it exacerbated carbon pollution. When I asked Minister Lundy today whether it is in Australia's national interest to exacerbate carbon pollution, in particular in relation to the Galilee and Bowen basins and extraction of coal, Minister Lundy really insulted the intelligence of everyone campaigning on global warming by suggesting that, uh, in fact, the fugitive emissions from coal in Australia were small, therefore this was not a problem. It is a major problem. Mr Deputy President, it is estimated that the coal extracted from the Galilee Basin will be of such volume that if it was a separate country, it would be the world's seventh largest emitter. Now, if ever there was a project which exacerbates carbon pollution in a global context, it is the Galilee Basin. And if you take seriously the notion that it is not in the national interest to exacerbate climate change by approving projects that do, then you would be immediately out there opposing Galilee and Bowen Basin and any new coal projects, expanded coal mines and coal projects. They are built for export, and Australia is actually pushing global pollution on the rest of the world by expanding its coal exports. Secondly, President Obama made very clear that it has to stop giving tax breaks to the big oil companies in the United States, which he recognised as some of the wealthiest countries in the world. That's why I asked the minister, when are we going to stop giving tax breaks to the big fossil fuel companies in Australia? In fact, we spend $2 billion every year in fuel tax credits to the big miners alone. That is a fossil fuel subsidy. Next year we're hosting the G20 in November in Brisbane. We have already signed up under the former Prime Minister Rudd with President Obama to cut fossil fuel subsidies. To cut fossil fuel subsidies, Mr Deputy President. And what have we seen? No, not a cut in fossil fuel subsidies. In fact, a refusal to cut fossil fuel subsidies, a refusal to stop giving $2 billion a year to the big miners and instead taking the money out of the pockets of single parents, refusing to increase New Start, and now cutting universities by $2.3 billion. So you'd rather give a fossil fuel subsidy to the big miners, 80 per cent of whose shareholders are overseas, the overwhelming shareholder value and profit going out of the country, and rather than support our own universities, you come back and say we're going to slash universities rather than end fossil fuel subsidies. So what was the value? of the then Prime Minister Rudd signing on the line with President Obama to cut fossil fuel subsidies. And at the time, Treasury had indicated there were 17 
fossil fuel subsidies in Australia. But guess what, Mr Deputy President? They changed the language and decided they were only going to end inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. And hooray! Australia doesn't have any inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, so the need to get rid of them was over. Well, that's the kind of semantics that is betraying the climate, Mr Deputy President. That's why this generation is now suffering extreme weather events. And whenever I hear speeches from the coalition talking about the costs of climate change in terms of actions to address it, we never hear the costs in terms of the deaths and infrastructure destruction because of in more extreme weather events and the intensity of those weather events. And it has already cost us billions in terms of Queensland after the flooding there, after Cyclone Yassi, not to mention the fires, the heat waves, all of the other major events. And the Climate Commission has just come out recently saying it's going to get worse. The government needs to stop increasing coal Thank exports. Thank you, Senator Milne. Your time has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Milne be agreed with. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it.